Okay, good morning, everyone. Let's uh, dive back in. Uh, we covered a lot of ground last time in lecture six on uh, physical simulation. We saw all the six pieces put together. We talked about position control, velocity control. Any questions about any of that now that you've had a chance to let some of it sink in? All good? You're getting a chance to play around with motors and position control in assignment four, but we're sticking with open loop control for now because we don't have our neural network controller to connect the sensors to the motors, which will close the closed loop of closed loop control. We'll get there uh, next week. All good? Okay, so we started last time, uh, we started last time uh, by looking at the relatively short history of evolutionary robotics that goes all the way back to the mid 90s. And we're looking at two initial experiments. So as we start to move through the rest of the course, we're gonna use a lot of the building blocks that we've already seen. We're gonna see different combinations and different versions of those building blocks in different experiments. As I mentioned, I don't expect you to remember every little uh, nitty gritty detail of every robot and every experiment we look at, but these experiments are chosen to illustrate certain underlying principles of evolutionary robotics and specifically some aspects of evolutionary robotics uh, that makes it desirable compared to other approaches to robotics. So just keep an eye out for why we're talking about a particular experiment. What concepts is it meant to illustrate? Okay. We ended last time, uh, we ended last time by uh, getting to know the humble little Kepra, which is the great, great, great grandparent of uh, Roomba, Amazon robots, a lot of robots that are starting to wheel around. Uh, in increasing frequencies uh, in the real world here. They all date back to the early 90s. And the Kepra, which was nice to play around with, because it was relatively small, you could put it on a tabletop and carry out experiments. So we ended last time by looking at this very first evolutionary robotics experiment, long before physics engines existed, at a little simple Kepra. It was attached by a tether to uh, the desktop computer, no Bluetooth at this time. The robot was sensing some information, sending that sensory information back through the tether to the computer. The computer would simulate the neural network controller, it would transform the sensor values into motor values, send those motor values back along the tether, tether to control the robot. In addition, there was a little laser, uh, a little laser emitting device in the upper corner uh, of this apparatus they built over the table and there was a little laser detection uh, module on top of the Kepra that would allow uh, through the connection between the laser and the Kepra so that both could compute the con current position in X and Y coordinates on the top of the table and the current heading, the angle of the robot. These three numbers are information that the evolutionary algorithm has. The evolutionary algorithm is going to measure the fitness of a given neural network running on the robot as a function of its position and heading. The robot itself is going to not have access to this information. It's going to have information to other data which is coming in through its sensors. So we're going to see this again and again in a lot of experiments. Sometimes the evolutionary algorithm is looking from a distance and measuring the behavior of the robot and that information is often different from the information that the robot itself has to work with. Okay, just keep that in mind. Okay, let's imagine you time traveled back to the mid-1990s and you had control over this desktop computer. You could write various evolutionary algorithms and different, different fitness functions for this robot. What kinds of behaviors might, be able, might you be able to evolve for this admittedly humble robot? I left out one detail here, which is the sensory information that it has. Assume that it has some basic information about proximity. So it's sending out infrared beams in front of it and detecting the time interval in which those beams head out and come back. What kinds of behaviors might you be able to evolve for this robot? Absolutely, right? So we can put some little objects on the table, which is exactly what the researchers did in this experiment. Uh, they built a little maze for the robot. And in this, very first, uh, in this very first experiment, they were going to evolve neural networks for the robot. 
so that it would circle through the maze as quickly as possible, race around the maze, and obviously don't smash into uh, the walls. You can see a breakdown of the robot in top left. It's almost a Breitenberg vehicle. It's a little bit more complicated than a Breitenberg vehicle. This particular robot has eight proximity sensors. So these are, again, infrared sensors. It sends out a, a beam of infrared light and measures how long it takes for that beam to come back. It has six of these sensors on the front, two on the back. As you'll see in the bottom right there, the raw numbers that are coming back, they're transformed to lie in the range of zero uh, to one. So a, a sensor that reports a value of zero says, I don't see anything in front of me. A sensor that reports a value of one says, I'm flush up against some object. And the values between zero and one indicate objects that are further or closer to it. The higher the value, the closer an obstacle is to that sensor. We have uh, these eight sensors attached to two neurons in the center that you can see here. These are two motor, motor neurons. Each motor neuron has a connection to the two motors, and it's going to spin the motors forward and backward. A value of a motor neuron, uh, if a motor neuron has a value of zero, it's commanding the, zero, the wheel to hold still. Positive values rotate forward, negative values rotate backwards. Is this position control or velocity control? Spin, positive values mean spin forward, negative values mean spin backwards. Is this position control or velocity control? Velocity. It's velocity control, right? So spin forward at some centimeters per second, for example, right? Okay, very, very simple. As we're going to see in a moment, they evolved the weights of these synapses, and there are 6 times 2 in the front, 12 synapses, and 2 times 2 in the back, so 12 plus 4, we've got 16 synapses, and the little horizontal arrows pointing outward, these are just passing the motor neuron values to the motors. You'll notice something else if you look very carefully, and it might be difficult to see from the back, but if you look carefully, you'll notice that there are two different arrowheads that are used in this uh, cartoon visualization here. There's a normal arrow, which represents excitatory connections, and a notched arrowhead, which represents inhibitory connections. In this case, the researchers are building in a little bit of domain knowledge. This is, again, something we're going to see that differs a little bit from experiment to experiment. Some, experiment, some, some investigators bias evolution towards certain kinds of solutions. And in other evolutionary robotics, we're going to see the experimenters try their best to step back and sort of just let evolution do its thing. This one is somewhere in between. The investigators are saying, we have an intuition about this problem. We know that ipsilateral connections we mentioned this, I think, when we talked about Breitenberg vehicles. Ipsa meaning same, lateral meaning side. So you'll notice the right-hand sensors, which are attached to the right-hand motors, have excitatory connections. And the contralateral connections, the synapses that pass from the right side of the body to the left sensor neuron uh, and vice versa, have inhibitory connections on the front of the robot. On the back, it's all excitatory connections. The researchers said, we don't know in that case. So we have inhibitory ipsilateral connections and excitatory contralateral connections. What's the intuition here? How did the investigators feel confident that that would sort of help the robot spin around the maze and not bump into obstacles? Where have we heard this pattern? Where have you seen something like this pattern before? Not exactly this pattern, but something like it. It's like a Breitenberg vehicle. Is it the coward or the aggressor in this case? It's the coward, right? This thing should be, quote unquote, afraid of obstacles or sides of the maze. So we know that that's relatively easy from Breitenberg vehicles. What we don't know is what exactly the magnitude of influence of the different sensors should be on the motors. So they're going to evolve all, what did I say, 12 plus 4, all 16 synaptic weights. So they're going to have a vector with 16 numbers in it. Those numbers are simply magnitudes. 
So uh, in the case of the inhibitory connections, they're going to take those values and assign them as negative numbers. In the case of the excitatory connections, they're going to take those numbers from the genome and assign them as positive numbers. So they're setting the sign of the synapses, but not they're going to let evolution play with the magnitude. OK. OK. Now we need to write down a fitness function that's going to assign a single number to each neural network or each set of synaptic magnitudes that we drop into the Keppra and let it drive around on the table. And at the end, we want to get back a value. It's going to be a single value for now. Uh, we're going to represent uh, this value, or we're going to represent the fitness function with phi here, phi for fitness function. To make our lives easier, we're going to try and write down this function that's going to range between 0 and 1. 0 is the worst possible thing that the Keppera can do. And 1 is exactly what we want the Keppera to do. Remember that we're going to use the position and orientation of the Keppera that we're getting back from that laser turret. The, the robot itself has these eight proximity values. We're going, to use, uh, we're going to use VL and VR. We're going to take position over time and compute, uh, or sorry, we're going to actually use the velocity of the wheels, not the velocity of the robot in this case. So we're going to get back the speed of the two wheels. And we're also going to get back the speed of the eight proximity sensors. Sorry, I misspoke. This doesn't quite match up to the original formulation. Doesn't matter for our purposes. We're going to build up our fitness function from these 10 values that we have uh, at our disposal. We're going to assume that the robot drives for 10, 15, 20 seconds on the tabletop. So we actually have, for each of these 10 values, we have values over time. So we have a 10 by T matrix. What are these 10 values at every time step over some 20 second period? We're going to assume for now that we're going to just collapse time. So we're going to take the average of each of these 10 values over time. So VL is going to be the average speed of the left wheel. R, VR, the average speed of the right wheel. Uh, I sub 3 is the average value of the third proximity sensor, and so on. These are the variables we're going to use to, to write down our fitness function. What is it? How do we write down a fitness function that if we give it to an evolutionary algorithm will evolve neural networks that cause the robot to race around the maze faster and faster and not crash into the walls? Ah, okay. So we're talking about speed. The first, first obvious thing is we don't want the robot to sit still. So we're going to make use of VL and VR. We could select, we could just plug in VL times VR for a moment. And let's just run that fitness function in our head. Phi equals VL times VR. That will select for robots that spin their wheels, both wheels forward as quickly as possible, which will cause it to crash into the wall, not exactly what we want. But as you pointed out, we want to try and allow, within reason, evolution as much freedom as possible. Our intuition, at least for those of us that are drivers, is we usually feel more comfortable driving forward than driving backwards. Why? Seems like an obvious question. Our eyes face forward, right? We're, our ancestors were apex predators. Predators tend to have forward-facing eyes with a relatively narrow field of view. We don't need to worry too much about other predators sneaking up on us from behind. That fact of our embodiment informs a lot of the technology around us, including cars and driving. And the way we build robots. They built more proximity sensors into the front of this robot than its back, right? However, it, it can, it does have eyes in the back of its head in this case, so maybe we allow negative driving as well, if that happens to be a good solution. How would we include VL and VR to allow evolution to select for robots that either drive around the maze forward as quickly as pass possible or backwards as quickly as possible? Let's take the absolute value of VL and VR, which is exactly what the researchers did. So we got half of the puzzle figured out, but obviously we need it also not to crash into walls. How do we do that? Uh, 
Any ideas? Great, so good, good point, right? So we have our velocity component. We know how to select for driving. We've got this other component now, which is to sum up all of the infrared values. Do we take those two components and add them together or multiply them together? Does it matter? Uh, probably add because if either is zero. Okay, possibly. In this case, the researchers, if you just focus on the bold for a moment, they multiplied the terms together. This is, again, another theme we're going to see over and over again in different evolutionary robotics experiments. We're trying to boil down the, the behavior of the robot to a single number. But usually, even for very, very simple behaviors like this, there are multiple things that we want the robot to do and multiple things that we want it to do not. Right? In this case, go quickly and also do not crash into walls. How do we combine these various components together? Evolution, as it's evolving neural networks, is gonna to have to try and strike balances between these various uh, competing factors. Again, in this very simple example, one of the reasons why it's nice to uh, spend some time on this experiment is these two things are in direct opposition to one another, right? A robot that goes really fast has a very high chance of bumping in uh, to walls, right? So we need to try and balance this a little bit. We need to slow the robot back down so it has time to turn away from walls. But slowing things down, it's gonna take a bit of a hit. So do we add or do we add, multiply? We're gonna see later in the course there's other things that you can do that are even smarter than add and multiply, but we'll, we'll get there in time. Okay, in this case, they chose to multiply together these terms, and you'll see there's three terms, but we'll just ignore that for the moment. We're just, just focus on the multiplication of V and one minus I. They're multiplying it together for the reason that was just mentioned in the back there, which is they want evolution to be pretty strict. If either term is zero, you're out. You have a fitness of zero. You have a maximal, you have a, a, a guarantee that you're gonna be deleted and not leave any offspring into the next generation. So it, the evolution is very quickly going to select for neural networks that get maybe low, but at least non-zero values for all of these terms. It's kind of forcing evolution to make sure that it finds the rudiments of both behaviors, move and don't crash, and then gradually improve those two behaviors over time. If we add them together, and once you have your evolutionary algorithm running, you can play around with this. Sometimes evolution will be lazy and say, if I'm adding things, I'm just going to sacrifice one of the terms and focus on this other term. I'm just going to go as fast as I can, and if I crash, I crash. Question? Uh, could you put weights when you're adding the differences together? We'll also see that. You can put a weighted sum. You could, you could say w, time, w, V times V plus W sub I times I. What's a good value for W, V, and W, I? Okay. Okay, that's a good intuition. So we're going to weight the crashing term, the I term maybe more than the other. Okay. In practice, it's often hard to actually come up with good values for W to actually get evolution to do what you want. This is a great point. It's difficult to do this. It's very difficult to set up a problem where evolution is going to eventually arrive at a good trade-off between various features of the behavior. In fact, it's still an open problem in the field to this day. There's increasingly complex and clever ways to do it, but none are perfectly satis satisfactory. If you've ever taken a machine learning course, you probably spent a lot of time talking about loss functions. Some, some people like this loss function. Some people like that loss function. Same battle is being waged in AI that it is in robotics. How do you actually write down and describe to the computer 
something it should use to reward behavior without telling the computer exactly what you want. Then it's self-defeating. You might as well you might as well just try and come up with these weights on your own. Very, very tricky to tell a robot what you want it to do without telling it how to do it. Is there another question somewhere? Yep. What was the point of retribution loops at the back? Yep, okay, so let's dive into this actual into this actual description now. V is easy, it's basically what we said before. So uppercase V is the, they're gonna sum the absolute values. There's actually a sum inside this term. They chose absolutes, again, because they didn't want to bias the robot towards forward or backward travel. So you can convince yourself uh, that an uppercase V of one is a robot that's spinning both wheels forward at 0.5 plus 0.5 centimeters per second, or both of them are spinning at minus 0.5 centimeters per second throughout the driving trial. Let's uh, skip to the one minus i term for a moment. So i, I actually I don't like their notation here. It's a little bit confusing. But i without a subscript is going to be which of the eight infrared sensors over the entire 20 seconds of the driving trial had the highest value? Did it crash? In which case, one or more of those sensor values reported a one? Or did it get close to the wall? We know from the uh, we know from the in the proximity sensors that they range between zero and one. So we're going to do one minus. We're going to select for i values, for i values that are as close to zero as possible. Stay away from the walls. Why this delta v term? Forget about the square root for a moment. Why delta v? Why did they add in this additional detail? I'll bet you these investigators originally ran this experiment with v times 1 minus i, and it didn't work. Absolutely, right? So let's look at the uppercase v. Imagine you have a neural network that spins the left wheel at plus 0.5 centimeters per second and spins the, back, uh, the right wheel at minus 0.5 centimeters per second. Perfect you get a V score of one, right? You have a robot that stays in place and spins about in place. This is our first uh, encounter with perverse instantiation. Perverse instantiation, which crops up everywhere in AI and robotics. And in my personal opinion, this is the biggest challenge that AI and robotics faced and still faces. We sit down and we write a computer program that is going to train an autonomous vehicle or train a robot. We are convinced that we have told the robot, or we have told the computer how to select for good behavior and punish bad behavior. And in retrospect, when we see what behaviors the computer actually came up with, it is not what we wanted at all. What are some other examples of perverse instantiation that you've heard of? Some of them, if they're funny enough, or dangerous enough, or scary enough, make it into the popular press. What are some examples of some perverse instantiation? That's a perfect perverse instantiation of jumping. Jumping is actually hard. If you try this for the final project, you will find there's not just put your arms or your, uh, or your legs in the air. There are many, many perverse instantiations of jumping. Other examples? Yep, moon, in some cases, when it's dark, there's a big, bright circle in the sky at about this height. It's obviously a traffic light, right? That's a great example of perverse instantiation. Others? You probably all suffered from autocorrect fails on your phone, right? Your phone is convinced that, no, that's the word you want. I know you think you want another word. No, no, you want this word. Trust me. This is the one, right? It's exceedingly difficult. 
There is still an ongoing debate that the first human pedestrian that was killed by an autonomous car, which happened, I think, three years ago now, it's still not clear. It might have been, it might have been the pedestrian's fault. It might have been uh, an instance of perverse instantiation. It might have been a little bit of both. So lots of examples of perverse instantiation that are hilarious, some that are not so hilarious. Would that be the same with uh, the Boeing flight, the 737 MAX? Tell me about the 737 MAX. They like have a sensor that, you know when planes fall? Yep. They made a sensor on the wings that would make, whenever it felt that it was falling, it was putting the wings down. Okay. And this happened right after like the departure, because it thought it was going up, but it was just going like, um, the thing is like it can't, it just keeps it uh, a lot. Yep. And instead of like letting it go, it just like, went straight down and went back. It was like eight, six, six or eight flights. Yeah, yeah, I remember this now, exactly. So that, a, another great example, right? From the point of view of the flight software or the sensor on the 737, it was convinced it was doing the right thing, right? You told me when I sense this particular sensor values that I should do the following action, right? Very, very difficult to solve this problem. If we ever will, maybe, maybe not. We'll see it a lot in evolutionary robotics. And there's a, a joke in the field, which is that evolved robots are like teenagers. They'll do exactly what you asked them to do, but not in, the way you, not in the way you wanted them to do it. They'll follow the letter of the law or the terms of the fitness function, but they won't obey the spirit of the law, what it was meant, what this function is meant to do. How can they? They don't know what, what the underlying motivation of us humans were in writing down this equation. If the Kepra could speak, it would probably say, it's your fault. You told me to do this, and spinning in place is perfectly fine. There's nothing in there that says, drive around the maze. So I'm guessing in this very first experiment, and probably in every evolutionary robotics experiment since, somebody wrote down a fitness function, it didn't work. They wrote down version 2.0, it didn't work. And they published version 3.0 of their fitness function, or version 7.0, and off we go. Okay, what does delta V do? How does delta V fix the problem? Delta V is in there to fix this perverse instantiation of spinning in place. How does it do so? Exactly. It tries to make sure that they're not opposite from one another. Let's look at that middle term for a moment in bold here. The, when you're starting to read fitness functions, the first thing you want to be able to pick out when you're looking at these different terms, in this case there are three terms, are these terms, is each term rewarding that particular behavior or punishing for that behavior? In the first term, it's rewarding for V, whatever V is. And in the case of 1 minus I, it's punishing for I. We'll assume that all the terms in this case are growing from zero to one. In this case, more i is bad, more v is good. So in the middle term, we immediately see the same pattern, one minus something. Whatever is on the right-hand side of that one minus, it's punishing for that. The larger the square root of delta v is, the worse the behavior is. Let's again forget the square root for a moment. So if we dive in at delta V, you can plug, mentally plug in some values there for VL and VR and convince yourself that delta V is maximal when VL is plus 0.5 and VL, VR is minus 0.5 or vice versa. Yeah? So the, this fitness function is trying to select for uh, behaviors or neural networks in which VL and VR are close to one another in value. And the uppercase V is selecting for those to be both very high, very positive, or both very negative. The square root term that they added on, this is a, a very subtle detail here, it selects for as delta V starts to grow from zero to be slightly non-zero, it, the square root makes that value even larger. So it's, uh, it's actually punishing more uh, for early values of delta, delta V. So it's selecting for strong differences 
at the beginning when evolution starts running and delta v is relatively small. It's relatively quickly trying to weed out these perverse instantiation examples of spinning in place. I think you're right. I think this was just a little bit of laziness. Yeah, we don't we don't really need them. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I apologize for the quality of these figures. This is a relatively old paper. It's the first time we've seen a fitness curve. We're going to see many many more fitness curves in the top left. Uh, it's hard to read here, but on the horizontal axis we have evolutionary time not the 20 seconds of driving around in the maze. This is the slower time scale of evolution. We have the number of generations of populations of neural networks, where each neural network is dropped into the Keppra. The Keppra drives around for 20 seconds or 30 seconds on the tabletop. The computer computes one number for, for phi, assigns that to that vector of 16 synaptic weights and on to the next neural network. There's no simulator here. All evolution was done on the physical robot, so this was very slow. It took 40 minutes to do one generation, and as you can see, they did uh, 100 generations here on the horizontal axis. It took them a little under three days to do. Uh, years after this, I was involved in a similar example, uh, a similar experiment where we sat there night and day, and every 20 seconds, I pressed the enter key on the computer, which sent the next neural network to the to the robot. It took a few breaks, but we tried to get this done as quickly as possible. Extremely boring. Took quite a while. <laughs> Definitely not an automated process, which is what evolutionary robotics is all about. But in some cases. Sometimes doing things directly on the hardware is better than trying, uh, is faster than trying to create an accurate simulator of your robot. Okay, so after three days, they had this upper curve, which is showing the fitness on the vertical axis, the value of phi, uh, the value of phi uh, achieved by the best neural network in the population. And the lower curve is reporting the average phi values across the population of neural networks during that generation. So more or less steady progress. And you can see that if the investigators had had more stamina and had kept going, evolution probably would have found better solutions. Uh, it was difficult to capture video at that time and embed it in a paper. So they took the behavior of the best, the most fit robot at the end of the run, and they showed how it moved through the maze. Each uh, each line segment here corresponds to the position of the robot. The center of the line segment represents where the robot was at that point in time. And the angle of the line represents the direction in which the robot was heading. How did the robot do at traveling through the maze? Is this the optimal solution? After 2.77 days, did it find the optimal solution? No. How do you know it's not the optimal solution? You can see a better one, right? So you can see uh, it got into a little bit of trouble here in the bottom left of the maze and had to slow down and make a tight turn. So line segments that are closer together represent that velocity is dropping, right? So Evolution is a satisficer, not an optimizer. We can't guarantee that it's ever going to find an optimal solution, but not bad. Okay. Again, I apologize for the quality of this figure. We have evolutionary time still on the horizontal axis. And on the vertical axis, they're plotting the values of those three terms from the best neural network in the population at that time. How did evolution strike a balance between these three terms over time? These three terms are kind of in opposition with one another, right? The faster the robot goes, the more likely it is to crash into the wall and take a hit on that third term. How did evolution go about striking trade-offs between these three terms? The solid line is v, uppercase v. So what was happening over evolutionary time in terms of velocity? So it looks like the robot started slow and tried to stay away from the walls and gradually it got faster within it. 
walls. Absolutely, right? So it traveled relatively, relatively slowly, uh, and then gradually, well, very gradually over evolutionary time, neural networks were evolving that were driving the robot faster and faster. And if you look at the dashed line, it's a little bit higher at the beginning, but then it stays relatively constant. So evolution is figuring out how to keep the robot away from walls, which is pretty trivial if you don't move very fast at all, and then gradually increasing the speed, but keeping this obstacle avoidance, right? So it's not necessarily improving all of them at once. It's sort of getting one of them figured out early on, kind of the easier one, and then gradually improving the other one. As we move on and look at other experiments, there's going to be more and more competing terms which get harder and harder for evolution to balance. In this case, evolution did an okay job. Okay. This is just, they were just playing around with different ways of trying to plot how these three fitness components changed over time. For those that are interested in scientific visualization, you can check this out. We'll skip over it in the interest of time. One experiment they, they tried out here that's kind of interesting is they wanted to see how well they could do against evolution. Remember that they were setting the signs, excitatory or inhibitory, for the ipsilateral and contralateral connections. They also sat down and tried to come up with the 16 weights for these synapses. And you can kind of see the solution they came up with, where the width of the line represents the magnitude of the weight for that synapse. Why did they make these middle synapses uh, stronger than the ones that were more uh, that were more contralateral and off to the side? There's an additional intuition they're bringing in here. Uh, because you have to turn at a farther angle to avoid obstacles that are directly ahead of you from the wheels, meaning there's a larger amount of time. Exactly, right? So if the proximity sensor is dead ahead of you, your front proximity sensors are starting to register an approaching obstacle, you should deal with that earlier and quicker and more extremely than you need to if the proximity sensors front left and front right start chirping, right? Okay. Sounds like a great solution. So it makes sense to me. You drop that into the robot and it gets stuck in one of the corners. Why? The, the Bradenburg vehicle, not the Bradenburg vehicle, the Kepra starts here. Well, basically is a Kepra, it is a Bradenburg vehicle. Starts driving forward, takes a little turn to the left, a little turn to the right, another left, another right, all the while slowing down, and eventually comes to a jittering halt right here. Didn't work, why not? It's approaching the corner symmetrically on both sides, and it responds symmetrically. Why does it respond symmetrically? Because it's getting a very similar input when it's trying to like turn one way or turn the other. Yes. Okay. And when you're like looking right into the corner, the front sensors are going to be say a little bit further away, but the side sensors are going to be higher, and then it's going to keep wiggling between those two, and whichever direction it turns, it's then going to get higher concentration to feed this intaking wall right. or feed this intaking wall so you just kind of flip on your symmetry. Absolutely, right? So the body of this robot is bilaterally symmetric. It gets itself into a particular situation where its sensory stimulation is symmetric, at least over short periods of time, this much stimulation on the left, this much on the right, this much on the left, this much on the right. And its brain is bilaterally symmetric. So its motor responses are bilaterally symmetric to these bilaterally symmetric sensory inputs, and it's stuck. If you hadn't seen this picture, at least for most of us, myself included, this seemed like a perfectly good solution. Thinking about thinking is misleading. You can now probably guess that the evolved solution, if you looked at the magnitudes of weights in the best evolved solution, the, the distribution of weights was actually asymmetric. Kind of interesting. Okay, it's a good thing because it gets you out of corners if you happen to get into a situation where you're seeing more or less the same thing on the left and the right. Another great example of thinking about thinking is misleading. 
Okay. One other interesting thing to note here in the evolved neural network, uh, it drove the robot at a maximum speed of 48 millimeters per second, but the wheels could, in theory, spin at 80 millimeters per second. We know that it didn't come up with the optimal solution, but 48 is really quite a long way from 80. Why is it driving it that slow? Why isn't it up closer to 67 or 72 or 75? Possibly. The Kepra has a very low profile. It's not gonna it's not gonna tip over. It's a good guess, but it's not that. It's not that if it drives faster and takes a tight turn, it's gonna flip over. Is it because it's bearing the weight of the robot? Because it's bearing the weight? Uh, it could be, but you can actually drive this robot at 80 millimeters per second. It's not weight, it's not turning radius. There's a, of course, there's a, it, it, there's a higher chance of crashing into the wall if you go faster. But why doesn't it just evolve a better solution to deal with the walls? Why is it so slow? The subtle, a more subtle reason here. Uh, a zero immediately tanks the entire term. So maybe it's just being very conservative because of the way the fitness function is selected for. That's part of the answer. Sampling rate of the sensor. The sampling rate of the sensor. So for the engineers here, you know, a sensor is taking values at certain time intervals. These days in 2022, most sensors are sampling so fast, like in your phone, you might as well uh, ignore the fact that it's actually blind between time intervals. There is a sampling rate for all sensors. In the mid-1990s, it was relatively slow. So you can think about driving a car. Don't try this at home. You can think about driving a car where you close your eyes for considerable periods of time. Don't crash into things. That's, in essence, what the Kepra has to do, given this mid-90s technology. 48 is about as fast as it can go, even if it's got a good set of weights, even if it knows exactly how and when to turn when it starts to detect an obstacle. So the evolution has come up with a solution that looks kind of crappy, but actually it's pretty good or close to as good as you can do given the limitations of the technology at that time. You know? Again, another advantage of evolutionary robotics. You don't need to know all the details of the sampling rate of the sensors and the maximum torque of the robot, uh, of the motors. Evolution will come up with something that works well within the various limitations of the robot. Okay, we're gonna switch and talk about the second uh, experiment that took place more or less about the same time across the English Channel uh, at the University uh, of Sussex. I did my master's degree there a few years after this experiment was done. I got to see this experiment uh, in the flesh, kind of a, a funny Rube Goldstein type setup here. We've got a table with the table cut out. They're going to place some obstacles on the floor underneath the table. And on top of the edge of the table, they're going to place a large gantry which again, might be hard to see here, they called the X trolley. So this trolley can drive back and forth horizontally across the table along the X dimension. And on top of that large trolley is a smaller trolley, the Y trolley, second gantry, that can drive vertically back and forth along the X, uh, along the X trolley, okay? So this robot has two motors, one that drives the X trolley and one that drives the Y trolley. Down through the center of both trolleys, they're hanging a camera upside down. So this camera is facing towards the floor. Here's the end of the camera right here. It's pointing straight downwards. And it's pointing at a dental mirror, a little circular mirror, which as you can see is set at 45 degrees, and there is a third motor. This motor is not under the control of the robot. This motor is just gonna spin at a constant velocity, and it's gonna spin, the, uh, it's gonna spin this dental mirror around and around and around. Why the heck would you build such a thing? What is this thing that's dangling down here? Well, it's like a 
sensing obstacles in three sixty direction. So by by spinning the dental mirror around and around, the camera is actually now not looking straight down, it's looking to the side and sweeping all 360 degrees. So the researchers were trying to overcome, again, mid-1990s technology here, to come up with an omnidirectional camera, something that can see horizontally all the way around. So it's kind of like an inverted periscope, right? So instead of the submarine sending something up and looking around, we're sending something down and looking around underneath uh, the table. So three degrees of freedom, we've heard this term before. There are three ways in which the system can move, but the robot or the neural network that controls the robot is only gonna have control over two of, two of these uh, degrees of freedom. Okay. Let's talk about the, sens the sensors now for this robot. You'll notice there's also this bigger plastic disc on the very bottom of this inverted uh, periscope. And this is gonna act as the robot's bump sensor. As it moves around underneath the table, if it collides with some obstacle under the table, they're gonna get some raw data back from the sensor. They're gonna take that raw data and they're gonna turn it into four binary values. They, they can sense the angle at which this plastic disc was hit. We're not gonna worry about those details. They turn it into four binary numbers. Was this plastic disc hit from the front right, front left, front, front left, front right, back left, or back right? They're going to, so that's four of our sensors. So we're gonna have four sensor neurons inside the neural network that's gonna control this crazy gantry robot. We're also going to need to pull out some information from this camera. If we were to redo this experiment today, we'd probably take all the raw pixel values and just plug them into a deep neural network. That didn't exist back then, so they had to do a fair bit of processing of that raw video feed. What did they do? They did the following. Remember that the camera is rotating, so the camera is actually seeing a moving field of view horizontally around the turret. They take all that video feed and collapse it into a single image, which is represented uh, in this cartoon example up here. So this robot can see north of itself, south of itself, west of itself, and east of itself. They do a little bit of manipulation to turn this into a circular field of view. Doesn't really matter for our purposes. The strangest thing, arguably the strangest thing of many strange things in this experiment, is they then drop three circles into this image. These are, uh, they refer to them in this, uh, they refer to them in this paper as receptive fields. These are otherwise known in biology as fovea. You have two fovea, one in each eye. Let's see if I can zoom in here for you. Right at the back of your retina is your fovea. It's a very small pit. And half of the information that your entire retina collects, the retina is shown in, uh, the retina is shown in yellow here. Half of all the photonic, uh, photonic information captured by your retina is captured by the fovea. There is this very small point on the back of your eye where you collect most of the information from the world around you. Why? You can focus on an object. You could probably focus if evolution had come up with a different solution, if it had distributed, uh, inf it had distributed sensory, uh, sensors throughout this retina at a relatively dense distribution. When you look around your world, you may or may not be aware of it, but most of the time, the only thing that's in focus is a very, very small piece of the center of your visual field, and everything else is very blurry. Your eyes jump around quite a bit to trick your brain into believing that you're actually seeing a big panoramic picture in high def. You are not. Why? Why did evolution come up with this solution? To be able to focus on everything in the world around us, it costs way too much energy, whereas it's a lot easier to just move your eyes with a small amount of energy and focus in on one thing. 
it, it could definitely, usually most of the solutions in evolution are about energe uh, energy somehow. It's definitely something to do with energetic considerations. Yeah. Okay. Uh, again, our ancestors were apex predators. There's a very good reason why, why trying to focus on a point out in front of you and jump around your eyes and track it. You don't care too much about motion out in the sides of your visual field. Prey care much more about motion in the periphery of their visual field. Like everything in evolution, there's probably hundreds or thousands of reasons why we have uh, fovea. In this experiment, they did it, the investigators kind of did it to make their life easier. They're going to try and pull out just a subset of information to plug into the input layer of the neural network. Taking all of the visual information coming from this camera, it would just be too much for mid-90s technology. In this case, they chose three fovea, kind of an arbitrary design choice. We have one or two, one in each eye. They drop these three circles into this image, and within that circle, the first thing they do is throw away color information. They collapse the RGB values into brightness values. They discretize those brightness values between zero for white and uh, 15, or sorry, 15 for white and zero for completely black. So they're gonna, within each circle, look at shades of gray. They're gonna take all of those gray pixels inside the visual field and average them together. So at one point in time, the dental mirror makes one complete revolution which gives us back one image, one 360 degree panoramic image horizontally around the, uh, around the inverted uh, periscope. And then we're boiling all that information down to three numbers or three integers between zero and 15. So they're doing this pre-processing to throw away a lot of information. The intuition here is that the robot, whatever we're going to evolve it to do, doesn't need all of this information. Like us, it should be able to evolve to get around perfectly fine with information coming from just these three points. So in essence, from the point of view of the neural network that controls the gantry robot, there are seven sensors, FL, FR, BL, and BR, and uh, receptive field one, two, and three. So at every point in time, the neural network is going to get seventeen. Uh, is going to get seven numbers, and it's going to output just two numbers. The neural network has two output motor neurons, X and Y, which drive the motion of the X trolley and the Y trolley. Seems like kind of a crazy setup. Everyone get the basic idea? Okay, why? Why build a robot in this way? There is a little bit of method to their madness here. There's a reason why they built the robot like this compared to the Kepro we just saw. Imagine you're a member of the English team here and you've just read the, English, uh, the Italian team's paper and learned that to get this relatively simple behavior, they had to put in uh, three days of people power to get this done. Okay, so they have sort of more direct control over the XY position of the periscope, which is the robot. Okay, why else? I decide we're gonna replicate this experiment so I'm gonna recruit you to come in for four weekends and sit there for the whole weekend pressing return to send the next neural network to the robot. How are you gonna get out of this assignment? The gantry robot is designed to get you out of having to do that. How? Think about the researchers doing the, doing the Kepper experiment. You take one neural network, it gets dropped into the, into the robot by the computer, the robot drives around, does whatever it does for about 20 seconds, and it's done. What happens then? Imagine that robot has driven into a corner, crashed in the corner, done. We compute the fitness function. Someone 
It's usually a poor grad student or an undergraduate intern has to reach into the maze, grab the Keppra, put it back at the starting point, someone else has to press enter, and the next one goes. What about the gantry robot? Exactly. So they wrote a little C script to replace the poor undergraduate interns. At the end of every run, that C script ran, which basically kind of ran in reverse what the gantry robot just did to get back to the starting point. So that every neural network, when it takes control of the gantry robot, it's always starting from the same initial conditions. Okay. So this is more about experimental ease than, than anything else. Okay. Okay, let's talk about uh, the fitness function. In this experiment, there were actually three fitness functions, phi 1, phi 2, phi 3. They did evolution for a while using phi 1. Once phi 1 had a sufficiently high value, they, sw they kept the population of neural networks, but they swapped out phi 1 and replaced it with phi 2. They kept evolution going for another dozen or so or 100 generations swapped out phi 2 for phi 3 and finished off the evolutionary run. This is known as incremental evolution, or in psychology, it's known as scaffolding. And we'll, we're going to see several examples of scaffolding or incremental evolution in this course. If you're going to try and evolve a robot to do something challenging, or you're going to try and teach a human being to do something challenging, like ride a bicycle, you, as the teacher, which in this case, we are the teacher, we're gonna come up with the fitness function. You scaffold the learner's environment. You make things easier on them so that they can start to acquire the rudiments of the behavior. And then once you as the teacher observe that they've reached some sufficient threshold, you make the problem harder. You remove the scaffolding and now the learner is increasingly pressured to learn the full form of that behavior. What are some examples of scaffolding in everyday life? We do this all the time. Training wheels. Training wheels. This is the canonical example. So scaffolding comes from psychology. It comes specifically from developmental psychology, the study of how uh, human infants develop into human adults. You want to learn a bicycle, put training wheels on, and as a parent, you start to learn what are the signals from the child that indicates they're ready to try things without the training wheel. Doing scaffolding well is difficult not just for the student, but also for the teacher. What are the three, what are the two scaffolds here, phi one and phi two that we need to scaffold the evolution of the final form of this behavior in phi three? What is this final behavior that we want? In this case, uh, in this particular experiment, they didn't even use any obstacles underneath the robot. They simply painted underneath, underneath the table on the back wall here, they painted two different shapes, a triangle and a rectangle. They took the gantry robot here and they moved it to a particular initial XY coordinate and then let the neural network control the gantry uh, to control the two gantries and the robot should drive towards tri the triangle and away from the rectangle. For each neural network, they ran that neural network four times on the robot. Each time the neural network started controlling the gantry robot at a different initial condition. In this little cartoon example here, I just drew two different examples. Okay, turns out this is a pretty challenging problem. Did you have a question? Good question. Okay, take a young person and put them on a bicycle without training wheels. What happens? They fall over. They get a fitness of zero. You put them back on the bicycle. What happens again? Zero. You put them on the bicycle again. This child's not going to be very happy with you, assuming they're willing to do so. You put them on a bicycle with no training wheels. You put them into a task that is beyond their current ability. They're going to get zero. 
There is no final exam in this course, but if there is and I administered that final exam to you right now, maybe you wouldn't get zero. You probably wouldn't do great, right? This, this whole course is scaffolding you towards a firm grasp of the field of evolutionary robotics, right? The reason scaffolding exists is if you don't do it for a lot of tasks, there's no gradient. So imagine we, imagine we uh, didn't apply this scaffolding trick here, and we had 100 random neural networks, and we put all those 100 random neural networks, we evaluated all 100 neural networks on the gantry robot. Now in this task, maybe it's not that complicated, but in most cases, all 100 neural networks would get a fitness value of zero. What does the evolutionary algorithm do at that point? Throw them all out, I guess, delete. They're all, they all have equal fitness, so which ones do you delete and which ones do you create randomly modified copies from? I don't know. So you create another 100, they all get zero. This is often known as a gradient collapse. Again, it happens in evolutionary algorithms. It happens in machine learning as well. In order for machine learning and evolutionary algorithms to proceed, there needs to be a gradient in the population. There needs to be some individuals that are a little bit better than, than others, right? If I administered the final exam to all of you and you all got a score of zero, I don't know what to do next, right? Okay, so again, I realize in this, this task is maybe, maybe not that hard, but given this setup, it actually turned out to be quite difficult. So they started with uh, this fitness function here, phi one, which is simply selecting for neural networks that always drive the gantry towards the back wall. The second fitness function here uh, is they're gonna place a black rectangle either back right, as you see in the cartoon here, or back left, and it should always, the neural network should always drive the gantry robot towards where the rectangle is. Once the robot can consistently drive towards uh, the rectangle, they switch things up a little bit and selected for a gantry robot that avoids rectangles and goes towards triangles. So learn how to get to the back wall or evolve the ability to get to the back wall. Evolve the ability to recognize and go towards objects. Be able to recognize different objects and go towards the good ones and away from the bad ones. Okay. Uh, I think we're a little bit behind where I want to be, so I'm not going to spend too much time on these fitness functions. They're pretty straightforward. We have the we have the x and y position of the two gantry of the two gantries. Remember, the robot itself does not have access to these two numbers x and y, but we can use them to create fitness functions. So in this case, we want to maximize y sub i, where y sub i is the distance from the front wall here, the one closest to us. We have four y values, which correspond to the final y value of the gantry when it's controlled by a given neural network four times. How well did a neural network do on average at driving the gantry towards the back wall? So far so good? Okay. You can sort of see how this works. Uh, in the next one, we're gonna define a value d sub i, which is the distance in x and y of the, of the gantry robot and the position x and y of the center of that back rectangle, and we're gonna select, or we're gonna evolve neural networks that minimize this distance. We have the negative sign here, so anyone that has a non-zero di is gonna take, is gonna, is gonna take a fitness hit, so you're trying to minimize the amount of penalty you get. The final fitness function, phi three here, we can see there are two terms, one minus another one. We're trying to always maximize our fitness functions. So, uh, so in this case, we are trying to, uh, in the first term here, D1i, D1i, uppercase D, lowercase D. So we're trying to maximize the distance from the rectangle, which is uppercase D1. And we're trying to minimize the distance, uh, D, lowercase D1. Again, I'm not crazy about the notation here, but basically we're trying to, in each case, minimize the distance of the gantry robot from the center of the, the triangle 
and maximize the distance of the gantry, or the gantry is trying to maximize its distance from the rectangle. We talked about weighted sums a few minutes ago. Here was an example where the investigators actually tried to write down alpha and beta. They were trying to weight these two, uh, these two terms. Okay, kind of rushing through this because I want to get to this last slide here before we break for today. Here is the best evolved neural network at work. Remember that we always start, uh, we always start the gantry robot at four initial conditions. Here's initial condition one, two, three, and it's a little hard to see, uh, sorry, one, two, three, and four. Initial conditions three and four are pretty close to one another. You can see the gantry robot uh, moving in this case, and the little short line segments are meant to represent the direction in which the robot is traveling. Remember, the robot can see 360 degrees around itself, so it doesn't really have a heading in this case. It's simply moving about in two-dimensional space. Is this the optimal solution? How do you know this is not the optimal solution? It, it's doing loop-de-loops, right? Kind of strange. We never said you have to go straight. So as long as you get there in reasonable time, loop-de-loops -loops are perfectly fine. Yeah. But clearly, it's doing what it's told. It's finding the, the triangle and going towards it. And I don't know if, whether you would argue that it's staying away from the rectangle or not. It would have been good if the investigator started the gantry robot right in front of the rectangle to see if it would actually drive away from the rectangle before going towards the triangle. They didn't try that. OK. Okay, last thing we're going to look at in this experiment is how does the neural network get the gantry robot to solve this pro problem? Remember, there is an evolved neural network that's driving the gantry robot. How, is the, how did the neural network evolve to solve this task? Remember that the neural network has seven input neurons. There are seven sensors. Bump, four of them are bump sensors. Since there's no obstacles in this task, those four sensors uh, are ignored by the neural network, or at least neural networks evolve to ignore those four sensors. They're not useful for this task. It's got to rely on these three, uh, these three circles. I just realized I forgot to mention one detail here. My apologies. In this experiment, like all the ones we've seen so far, the evolutionary algorithm is going to evolve the synaptic weights that connect the seven sensors to the two motors. Inside the genome, in addition to those synaptic weights, are some additional numbers which are going to actually affect, I don't know if it's the body of the robot, the additional numbers in the genome are going to affect the fovea that this robot has. It turns out that there are actually nine additional numbers, three triplets of numbers, x, y, and r, x, y, and r, x, y, and r. In each of these triplets, the x and y indicates where that genome wants the fovea to be placed. There are three pairs of x, y, so we're dropping, so the genome is saying where to place these three fovea, and there are three r values which represent the desired radius of each of these fovea. So evolution is evolving the neural network, and it's also evolving the relative placement and size of these fovea. Evolution is getting to choose what it looks at in this 360 view that the gantry robot has. So far, so good. First experiment we've seen where evolution is now broadening its reach beyond just the brain of the robot. OK. If you look at the left, you look at the left side of this neural network. There are uh, there are uh, there are two there sorry there are three fovea here. They should have called them F1, F2, and F3. They didn't. They called them V1, V2, and V3. Remember that these are integers between zero and fifteen. How dark that particular fovea is at a given point in time. You'll notice that this uh, evolved neural network ignores the third fovea. In essence, this neural network is saying, I don't need all three fovea to solve this task. I only need two. 
So it's, we didn't even, the investigators didn't even draw the third fovea. You can see synapses that are flowing from the input side of the neural network here towards the output side. Remember at the output side, we have, uh, we have these uh, two motors, which is left motor here and right motor here. The third one here, uh, what is the third one? I'm sorry, I misspoke. The third, there is a third motor neuron which controls the spinning, the, the rate of spin of the dental mirror. It's a detail that's not actually gonna matter for our purposes. We're gonna just ignore this third one here. We're just gonna focus on the two motor neurons that control the movement of the gantry, left and right, forward and back. We know, you'll notice that we have some hidden neurons in here. And there are some connections there. What do hidden neurons afford to the neural network? What is a neural network able to do with hidden neurons that it can't do without them? Remember our discussion about neural networks? It can do more information than it can with Exactly. So when we talked about neural networks, a neural network without a hidden layer cannot compute the XOR function. There's certain transformations from sensor values to motor values. That are, uh, that are impossible without hidden neurons. And this neural network has evolved some hi hidden neurons. Whatever this transformation is, it needs them. We'll notice most of these synapses are flowing from left to right. So the synapses are passing values from the sensor neurons towards the motor neurons. But we'll note it, you'll notice that there are also some recurrent connections, which we also talked about when we talked about neural networks. Recurrent connections either connect the neurons on the same layer, or you'll see actually there are some here, like this dotted line here, which actually flow from a motor neuron back towards a hidden neuron. What do recurrent connections allow a neural network to do? Remember, Remember things. So we see quite a few recurrent connections, which is giving us a hint about what this neural network is doing. It always goes towards the triangle and always moves away from the rectangle. Where is the recognized triangle neural module here? Where is the part of the brain of this, of this gantry robot that is recognizing a triangle and deciding what to do? And where is the part of the neural network that's recognizing the rectangle and deciding to go away from it? So remember when we talked about the XOR neural network, it computed uh, AND, and then it computed OR. It computed two separate subfunctions in different parts of a neural network, and then combined them. If you had to write down something that, if you had to write down a, a program that controlled the gantry robot to do this, you'd probably create a recognized triangle subroutine and a recognized rectangle subroutine and combine them in some way. As was just pointed out, this neural network does not do that. Okay, we've got two minutes left. Let's see if we can do this. How does it recognize the triangle and go towards it and recognize the rectangle and stay away from it without explicit recognition, recognition modules? What's the trick here? Uh, I would guess it has something to do with uh, 0 through 15 values. Maybe there's a certain way that they are on the triangle for moving you got it, right? So there's something about the movement of the gantry as it moves onto or as its fovea come into contact with the triangle and then leave the triangle. It's sometimes moving in loop-to-loops, but most of these have a little bit of a curve in them so that the objects are flowing into and then out of the robot's visual field. If all you can see is blobs of black and white appearing and then disappearing, on your two fovea, and these are your two fovea, what's the difference between triangle and rectangle? Um, the rectangle is going to provide input to the fovea so it can see through more time because it's got two <coughs> fovea, and then the triangle is definitely the fovea can see what's on the triangle. 
Okay, so that's one possibility. The two fovea here go dark for the same amount of time if they sweep over the rectangle, but different amounts of time if they sweep over the triangle. Also, if you look at the angle of these two fovea, if the robot is, quote unquote, looking from right to left, those two fovea are gonna hit, uh, are gonna hit the edge of the triangle at about the same time. But as they sweep from right to left, they're going to hit the rectangle at different points in time. The time interval between the two fovea going dark and then alternatively going light again is different. The solution, there is no, there isn't the uh, intuitive definition of a triangle. It's got three sides, the rectangle has four sides. That's our definition of triangle and rectangle. If you were able to ask this evolved neural network what a triangle is, it would say a triangle is two blobs that turn dark with this amount of time interval between them. A rectangle is something in which those two blobs go dark but at a different time interval. That is the definition of triangle and rectangle. It is a very non-intuitive definition of these two shapes. That definition combines motion, time, color, or in this case perception, black and white, and, this, and memory. You need to remember when these two blobs went dark. This evolved neural network is probably the best example we're going to see in this entire course of embodied cognition. There is some weird combination of motion, body, neural network, time, behavior that gives rise to this behavior. Thinking about thinking is misleading. Have a great rest of your day. You have a quiz due tonight. You're working on assignment four. See you next Tuesday.